Kate and Janice, and it's 3 p.m. and we're back on the regular schedule, and I'd like to bring you to the latest episode of Where Are the Fern Grows. Uh, we couldn't get Zach Galifianakis in, so we had to settle the next best thing. We'll make do. I don't have anything else to say other than take it away. Enjoy yourself. I was up next. Keep him off if you can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try and keep him off for a little bit longer. But the, this afternoon, thank you very much for being with us. And really, the key here is to focus on an amazing lady here, Janice, who's been doing some incredible work around women in security. And we've talked the last couple of days about hot topics. You've heard me on stage talk about culture and AI and lots of different things. But there's one thing we really haven't talked about, and that's how do we continue to really raise the profile of cybersecurity, not only amongst women, but amongst young women and children as well. And it's been awesome seeing you know, that all the kids participating over at PornCon and the other group with the Kids Fest today. And you know, I was really thinking about young women and, and how do we continue to keep them engaged, not just do lock picking and starting to code, but how do we continue fostering that and making it something really cool. And this amazing lady here has been doing a lot of work on it. So before we begin with the questions, how do you introduce yourself? Well, good afternoon. My name is Janice Mitchell. I got into information security after I spent um, quite a lot of time selling enterprise storage. And then I started, I was the first woman, um, actually the first person in the world to deliver single, single sign-on. Sold my company on Wall Street. So that was how I got into this field. I don't think most of us, or at least um, women, if you will, kind of set our, our direction at that time to really start into cybersecurity. I got into information security because I had a non-compete. And that was the only place that I could go. Was information security is kind of like, oh, and you, you want to start a company. And I remember one of the first sales calls that I ever made was to the chief information security officer at Nationwide Insurance. And he said, let me see if I got this straight. You're going to start a company in information security, and you think you're going to sell it. And he literally went like this and said, good luck, and walked out of the door. And so that was kind of my exposure in information security. Um, so that was the way that it went. And then, you know, it was kind of like I had somebody offer to buy my company out at RSA Security Conference because I was showcased out at RSA Security. And so that's the way that it went for me. So it's a little bit different than it is for a lot of what I'll say young men. And we're going to talk about the difference between young girls and young men and how society in general pushes information security, even how we teach boys and girls, how guidance counselors talk about boys and girls, um, how I got into the field, and go on from there. So we talked a little bit about your journey in cyber and what got you interested in security. But you know, what we're really focusing on today is how you founded the Ohio Cyber Women. What brought you there? What was your journey that led you to that? You know, so that's a really interesting question. When I sold my company, so when you sell your company, you kind of feel it's not really what you think that it is. It's not all of the pop bottles and wine and champagne. I'm just here to share with you, it's just not. Um, my buyers were in, obviously, New York. I was here in Ohio. It was very lonely. It was very depressing. I felt like everybody was getting on the code bus. I wasn't there. And um, so I started doing a lot of lobbying. I was put in a mentally retarded class when I was in fifth grade. And because I was put in a lot of mentally, uh, mentally retarded class, it was not because I was slow. It was because I was dyslexic. And back then, a lot of people didn't understand dyslexia. I was a gifted dyslexic. And so I decided after I sold my company, I wanted to spend a lot of my time and effort lobbying for the dyslexia field. And so I spent three years of my life lobbying in Ohio and nationally across the nation. Now you hear a lot about, a, a lot about the dyslexia. I will tell you a lot of that is because I started what was called the perfect storm in the nation. When Ohio fell with a dyslexia law, that was kind of a big deal. Ohio is what's called a whole language state. When Ohio fell, that kind of whooshed across the nation and allowed for a difference in dyslexia. So you're kind of going, well, what the, you know, what does it have to do with where we are today? It has a lot to do with where we are today. 
because of my knowledge of how dyslexia is and understand that one in five humans are undiagnosed by dyslexic, that also leads to believe the way that we're going about young people and young girls engaged in technology as a whole isn't going to work. Simply showing them something on a screen, taking them to a conference is kind of like this. Good analogy. <laughs> well, especially if you're ADHD. So back to one in five. One in five means if you're dyslexic. If you're dyslexic, you learn by doing. You have to engage multi-sensory education. I also grew up in 4-H. You all know what 4-H is. 4-H is all project-based learning. So I took Ohio through a program and combined the same thought process as well. If we do everything with a project-based learning, and combine everything and build our programs in the schools of Ohio, have the, the teachers in the classes do everything outcome-based, project-based learning. The dyslexics will excel and stop flunking in classes. Oh my God, why is this any different in technology? The girls aren't going in the classes because we think they're dark hoodie and because we think it's boring and because you sit behind screen. Why can't we get to the young girls in the same manner? Why can't we get them engaged earlier in school, get them hands-on learning, get them to know what they don't know, get them out of the, the hoodies, and get them engaged. Stop using the words cyber and security because if they're nine years old, I, I promise you, a mother who's taken them to ballerina school, she's just not using the words cyber and security. So the way that we're doing it is I'm, I'm saying, come play some games. We're going to give some prizes, and let's just see what happens. I don't use those words on purpose. And oh my gosh, let me tell you what. I'm, I'm aiming towards the girls that are musically inclined. I'm aiming towards the girls that um, like to do puzzles, like to do cartography. And we're just saying, just come play some games and let us show you some different things. I'm hitting the inner city girls, the underprivileged that would never, ever, ever have it. I'm hitting the Hispanics. I'm hitting my people that are Native Americans. And of course, we're going to hit the ones that are already privileged. And the results are, are fantastic. So we're going out and doing, so we have four different levels. So those are the 6th to 12th grade, and we're doing a, a Let's Play game event. And the whole pop purpose of that is it's a modified capture the flag. And the, the capture of the flag is also created in Ohio. Yeah, it's it's a modified capture of the flag. It is non-competitive, right? It's a little bit different than the way that a boy's mentality is tactical, right? Girls don't want to have that, so it's it's not competitive because it's the sixth to the twelfth. The thought process of the sixth grader is the twelfth grader. So it's a team learning based event. It's team learning everything. Then we actually have them boot up a Raspberry Pi, teach them how the Raspberry Pi, they get excited to see it come alive, and they see excited to see what it is. And oh, by the way, when they're done with the games, those inner city girls who have never seen a computer before, they get to take home the Raspberry Pi, they get to take home that monitor, and they get to take home their keyboard, and their parents are overwhelmed. Oh my God, what are you packing up in my car? And then, in the 4-H model, we call it an ecosystem because our program has the pre-professionals, so we're trying to get the girls into the program. So the pre-professionals get all excited because of all this cool stuff. Then the next level are the young professionals. The young professionals are under the five years. So the young professionals are the ones engaging and teaching the girls the activities. But the problem is in the, in, in, if you're working for Huntington Banks or if you're working for Nationwide Out Insurance here, she's never really getting that leadership activity. She's never getting that teaching activity. How does she get that activity to get to the next level up? Because guess what? We also have a problem in this world. Do you know what it is? Bias. It's bias. But there's also no women sitting at the table. Kate, how many women are sitting at the table at the board level? Well, I think, you know, when you look at that, you're, you're right. There's very few women in security. There's hopefully developing more, and I think it's one of the reasons that we need to focus on young women. But I'll tell you, in my own experience, I was the first woman to ever run externally a security company, internally see so at the same time. And when I would walk in the room, I would be told to go get the coffee. 
This is less than five, six years ago. And when, <clears throat> same thing in RSA, I'll never forget, I almost left RSA a couple of years ago if one more person said it was cute that I was running a security company. Oh my gosh, it's so cute they put you in charge. Oh my gosh, it's adorable. You're so cute. Let me tell you, these heels weren't meant just for walking. But it brings me to a question. You know, there is a lot of focus on young women, and there is a lot of focus on girls in security. Why now? Why do you think it's so important right now? That's a very good question because I tried doing this a long time ago, back in the year 2004 when I first saw it sold. I had Mike Morris, who was the chairman of AEP. AEP consumes the world's and produces the world's most of, uh, amount of coal. So I went to Mike Morris. He gave me money. I went to Steve Rasmussen for Nationwide Insurance and I started the same program all over again. Very good question. So we had 25 women in the room to start Ohio Cyber Women. And all of the women at Nationwide Insurance said, they took a survey, there's not a disparity of women in IT. And there's not a problem of women in IT. I will tell you, in the years of 2000, 1998 to 2013, there's been a decline of women in the IT field, MIS field, has declined 73%. And that happened when Clinton got into office and Clinton got rid of in-office testing and there was a big push for women to go with the careers of being school teachers and to be nurses. So women have purposely decided that we need to be nurses and we need nurses. But the reason why we need, so the, the next question you're probably going to ask me, why is it so important that we have women in the field of information technology, not just cyber? And I'll tell you, having been a dyslexic and having served on the board with all of these people that are so smart about the neuroplasticity of the brain, is a woman by nature the way that she is, is her thought process is a more collaborative in nature, her thought process is more strategic, her thought process is more pragmatic and is, is much larger. So it's not that she's better, it's just that she thinks differently and she's a little less tactical. The way that the solutions are working in today's the way that we're moving more towards a cloud. There are so many things that are going on all at once, it's a less tactical point of view. And so we need to bring a little bit more neurodiversity into the marketplace for it to work a little bit better. I would agree with you. I think you know, when you look at solid teams, security teams globally, the ones that are, I think, the most robust are the ones that recognize that and have a diverse workforce that's constantly looking at things together. So I would agree with you on that. From a girl's perspective, though, you talked about attracting young women from the inner cities. You talked about attracting a lot of different types of young ladies. My question to you is, you know, when you said 4-H, I don't know about you guys, when I think of 4-H, I think of farming. And that's just, yeah, yeah. And so I'm old school Girl Scout, and I know the Girl Scouts, I'm proud to say, are doing something as well with Palo Alto and some badges. But you really, when we were talking, kind of set me straight about 4-H. And so, I want you to talk a little bit about, as you're trying to expand the organization, what 4-H is doing and where they're really located, because I was shocked, so I'd love you to be able to talk about that a little bit. So 4-H has over 500 different projects that you can take. 4-H is the number one project on inner city schools, um, like in Los Angeles. It's the number one inner city program that exists in the nation. I didn't know that. That shocked me. A lot of people think that it's cows and pigs. I do. But it's, but it's also, so I paid my way through college with photography. Um, technology was not my first company. Actually, I used to own a photo studio. And I paid my way through, through uh, college with photography. But 4-H teaches you a lot of different things um, on a consistent basis, you know, just like Girl Scout does. But 4-H is a project space. It's an interview, it's public speaking, it's minutes. It's, it's based a little bit more on how business is run versus the way that Girl Scouts is solely really project based. 4-H takes you through the whole business. This is how you conduct a formal meeting, which you really, really need to know when you're sitting in the boardroom. Here's Rupert Goldberg as to how you run the minutes. Here's the here's here's a president's role. Here's a vice president's role. 
here's the formal way to conduct minutes, here's how you make a motion, here's how you make a meeting, here's how you do public speaking, and then when your project is done, guess what you get to do? You get to bring your project book up, here's how you go through your interview process, and then you have to give your public speech. So it really takes you through the full gamut. When you start in ninth grade, you can go all the way through your um, freshman year in college. So there's that repetitive process, so it's really ingrained in there. And it also teaches that team aspect of working with both the men and the boys and the girls. If you happen to have a, a vegetable, if you happen to have a photography project, if you happen to have a sewing project, now you take that project and you sell it. If it's an animal, you learn how to detach from the animal because you sell it and then it goes to market and you understand how it goes through the commerce. So it really is a little bit more business oriented. It's not just the agricultural point of view. Well, I think you and I could debate the 4-H and Girl Scouts, but I was really interested in the education because I think you're right. If it's giving the business skills that's just a tantamount thing, especially when thinking about all the different areas of cyber where we need skills. Well, so, that, so that goes back to the thing, how do the young girls, right, so how does the young girls, how do they get those, how do they get, so that's the big problem in business and in technology, right? The technology side of the business speaks one language, right? We're going to bring a release date versus end date. So an end date from the business side means one thing, a release date from the technology side means another thing. So that's a big problem. So with Ohio Cyber Girls, we're trying to teach them the business skills so that they understand the technical side as well as the business side. So that's why we're trying to build a kind of like a for each model. And I think that's awesome. So one of the things we did with the premise program very similarly was um, Right out of university, we would bring in young people from cyber backgrounds, not cyber backgrounds, and put them through two-year rotations. So they had two years of rotation with us, and then at the end, they were evaluated for placement. But in those, in that two years, they did four rotations, and similarly, one of the rotations had to be in client-facing or sales. And every engineer, every coder I brought into the program was ready to have a heart attack when I did that. You're going to make me do what? I'm going to go sell? But at the end of it, to your point, Everyone across the board said it was their best rotation because it forced them out of their comfort zones and it gave them the business acumen. So I agree with you 100%. It's a really critical skill I think we sometimes overlook. One of the things that the girls hear me say over and over and over is I want you to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. If you're going to be a cyber sister, you're going to learn how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because life isn't being about being comfortable all the time. You know that you're growing when you're uncomfortable about being uncomfortable. Okay, so I'm going to jump on something. You said cyber sister, and I think that's one of the coolest areas of the program that you have created is this idea of cyber sister and making it almost like a cool club for girls to be a part of this. So tell me about your inspiration for that. And I think you've got a card right there, but can you recite the guiding principles? Because I was pretty excited about it. Yeah, so it's I believe in women. Um, I empower other women. I am, sh I am smart. She is smart. I'm having a positive impact on other women and other young girls. I am conscious and I'm aware that I create my own destiny. And I am and I will and strive to be my best. And I'll be frank with you, again, 4-H, right? I pledge my hand if they're thinking and my heart and my head. So before every meeting you have that, and before every meeting we do this. But the thing that this is a little bit different is I made it into a little card, and this is now the cool card around Columbus, and it's a backpack card. But the only difference is that if you come into the group, you sign it, that you agree to the pledge, and then you have to go around and get all your cyber sisters. But this goes a little bit different. One of the problem that we all know that women do is it's this. You walk in the room. We're not nice nice to each other. I hate that. And the other thing that, that, that was really, really eye-opening was to my male board members. And they're like, what are you talking about? And all the girls in the group, and this was the most talked about subject in my first meeting. And they all said, oh my god, we hate the elevator eyes. And we want to stop the women cattiness. 
And so this is, and I hate women having this because I'm very, I was very close to my father and very close to my brother because women, I think, are very, very catty. It's, and it's, it's, I think, something we don't talk about that much. We don't talk about the, it. The funny part is I'm seeing less of it in the younger generations, but in my group and in it's our big, age, it's big. It's really interesting because I don't, working in the UK, I don't have the same issue. There's a big group of support in the UK. We all support each other. It's very, very different. But I'll tell you, in the US, it's, it's rampant. It is rampant, and it's sad. And so, it is sad. Um, case in point example, when I had my twins and then my son, I decided to take a step back for a couple of years and maybe just stay home and raise kids for a couple of years. I was told it would be career suicide and I would never get another job again. So, so I was this told I was an idiot. Buy another woman. Yeah, so this, this is designed to help We feel so, like if we get the younger girls to recite this after every meeting, and that I am what I am strong, she is strong. We are strong. Amanda, I am strong, you are strong. You know, it's it's getting you know, and she's she's my cyber sister, and I'll tell you, I think that this experience that she's had. So what's been your experience with me? What's the first thing that you've learned? <laughs> she's like, wait a minute, I don't want to come up here. Uh, yeah. 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 Yes, please take a picture of it. Um, so I guess one of the major things that I've learned is, is like you said, I can do it. I can be unapologetically me. How have I made you feel? You've made me feel better than I have in the last year. Uh, I was working in the government, working with all men, feeling like getting the coffee all the time. Um, and because of you, I feel stronger. I feel like I can do it. And if that's me at 37 years old, already in the midst of a career change, imagine what you can do with high schoolers. And I think the critical thing here is about, you know, when you talk about cards like that, is it's not a men and women issue. Women are derogatory to other women. But we have to work together to solve some of these diversity issues because how we think, how we approach jobs, you know, perfect case example of like these types of programs is I denied going into security six times. Was trained and said nope six times because I didn't feel I had the skill sets. And but that's the other, that's the other thing that we want to change is that these position descriptions are written. Um, too biased against women and the other thing is that you have to understand again the neural complex of a female a female is not going to apply for the job unless she can check off everything in the box percent or above. and that's why you've got to be conscious of the fact that a woman is so self um, deprecating of herself anyway because of the way that she was so I'm Native American, so I believe firmly that we are programmed by our other, by our parents. And so you've been programmed at some point to believe something doesn't work. And so in that job description, we're looking at what doesn't work. And if I don't work 100% in that job description, me as a female, I'm not going to apply. And so it's not that they're not out there, so I'm not going to apply because I don't match everything 100%. So is that one of your long-term goals then? So what are some of your long-term goals for the program? Like you, you talked about what you're doing. I know you're selling out events in Ohio, which is amazing. What are some of the things that you want to do going forward? So, so right now we're working on, um, right, the other biggest program that I have is, uh, so we have the other senior women. I have women that are VPs that are in this group. And so another program that we're working on right now is a mentor program. But my mentor program is a little bit different. It's not just be a mentor. I have a lot of women CISOs across the country that I want to actually spend time with my VPs and say, how did you get there? And it's, um, I'm calling it more a guidance program because in my opinion, the word mentor is kind of and there was a lot of talk in our com in, in our group about that. Oh, it's a mentor program. Yeah, you know, in my mind, excuse me, bullshit. You know what? Mentor is just a bunch of crap. I want to hook you up with somebody that is going to guide you and guide you. My dream is to get you 
sitting on a Fortune 500 board. That's our next goal. Because she's pretty excited about that. I, she might hold you to it. Yeah, that's my next goal, and that is not go have a speed dating, and that you meet somebody, and then it makes whoever's doing the group feel good because they have this group. It's it's a planned out. It's a planned activity on both parts. It's us putting together a program with the people that are participating in this event. It's for them opening up their kimono and for them sharing with you, oh my God, let's face it, success comes in the failure, right? So it's, it's me hooking you up with a Sh uh, Siobhan McDermott, right? Siobhan McDermott is a, a friend of mine and she's on the chair of Bank of America. She's head of global risk and security. And so it's her opening up her kimono and saying to you, here are all the mistakes that I made in my career along the way. Here's what I wish that I would have known. Here's what I would want to share with you. Now imagine what that does for you. So that shares a lot different perspective for you so that it allows for you to make your own what? Mistakes, right? Because, yeah. We're all human, we all still put our pants on one leg at a time, I promise. Success comes from failure. Success isn't always in success. So if you can have those one-on-one -on -one guidance and have a true guidance with somebody and learn from really where they're coming from, then that's going to elevate you and maybe we can help elevate her to get her sitting on you know, the board of NASDAQ. That would be a goal that I would love to get her. I've got, I've got those kind of connections. To me, that would be a successful program that Ohio Cyber Women could have. And it's, it's one of those things we talk about programs like that. You know, people, I've mentored people or guided people over the years, but even in my roles, I still rely day in and day out on the people I accept guidance from and have around my, and my in essence mentees. You need to have those sounding boards and people that are in like roles, to your point, so that you can discuss openly those oopses and those failures, because we all do fail, and then celebrate your successes. Or if you have a question, to un identify whether or not it's the right questions to be asking at that point. I've never taken a role. There's one guy who's been in my life since I was 21 years old. He's been mentoring me for almost 20 years. And I don't make a move without calling him and saying, what do you think? Because he knows me well enough to tell me when I'm being bullshit and also when I'm doing the right things. So to your point, putting programs like that together, it creates lifelong friendships and the ability to be honest about your career. It's awesome. So how can people get involved? Well, Businesses, corporations, sponsors, we have a couple of those in the room, and just individuals. So we, we are getting phone calls off the hook, which is kind of fun. So we have companies that, uh, we have companies that are calling us, come have your meetings at our office, come have your meetings at our office. And again, our goal is to, in Columbus, we're fortuitous enough to have seven Fortune 100 companies and a lot of, um, we have two unicorns in our, in our city. So one of the things that we like to do is because um, maybe somebody such as yourself, maybe you've never set foot into what a, a unicorn looks like for a VC. Does so, know what a unicorn is? No, I don't think so. So a unicorn is a startup company that has the ability or is looking to do an exit either going public or sell for over a billion dollars. So that's a unicorn. So from you know being a CEO of a startup, my dream would be to be a unicorn. But some of you in the room would know a couple of unicorns. So Zscaler was a unicorn. Uh, I'm trying to think recently, Snapsheet was a unicorn. Um, and most recently, there was one other big security one that just did it. But those are unicorns. Those are what we're thinking when we say unicorn. So. The, th the cool thing would be for us to have a couple meetings inside their office so you could see what the culture looked like in there. Or maybe the next meeting would be to be in Nationwide Insurance so you could see what the culture is like in there. Or the next meeting is to have the meeting in a J.P. Morgan Chase to see what the culture is in there. So we're trying, again, in the eyes of the community, is that every girl every young professional, every executive, so that you have the opportunity
to go see what the culture is like, to see what the people is like in every different place. My feeling is if I pick one place and I stay one place, then I'm really not helping you decide how to grow as a human being. If I remain kind of neutral and kind of move around and go in every single different environment as long as somebody has us, then we're exposing everybody for you to grow and for you to say, hey, I had no idea that this existed, which is kind of the whole point. So I'm a little jealous of Columbus right now because they have you in this program. I have fun so I'm not moving to Ohio any time in your future. So what are the plans on taking this nationally? How do I get this in Chicago? How do we get this here in Iowa? Well, Where so, are you going? What are we doing? How are we getting this out? Well, so right now we're in the process of kind of um, franchising the, so everybody can open up a chapter. So if you want to have, um, you know, Michigan cyber women, if you want to have Iowa cyber women. So I get Illinois cyber women. So you get oh, Illinois. So we have, um, we have the global franchise, if you will. Um, and so we're actually, um, what, I think it's on the 23rd, so we've got a very, very major uh, advisory firm that's willing to back it up um, financially to get, to get the funding. And then, again, like I said, the funding just seems to be coming in to help sponsor the different events. Everybody wants to get involved because it's really, it's, um, I call it an ecosystem. We bring the pre-professionals in. The pre-professionals are feeding in. They're the ones that are feeding in. We're trying to get them into the into the thing. The pre-professionals are feeding in to get the training and the leadership giving to the young professionals. The young professionals serve as the officers of the comp of the chapter. They get their training from the older professionals. The older professionals get their training from the mentors. So it's this whole little ecosystem of everybody helping everybody and it just is a beautiful thing. It's like everybody working around. I don't like conferences because I'm too ADHD and yeah, I meet everybody. But at the end of the day, is it really impacting anybody? It's not really impacting anybody. It's not impacting my community. And it's not impacting me for you to hire anybody. And are you really growing? Everybody's meeting everybody, but what are you really learning? What are you really retaining and how am I really taxing? The other thing that we didn't talk about was uh, the Cyber Sister Saturdays. So now the girls have come in, they've played with their Raspberry Pis, but now we really want to rock it out, right? So now we've, we're rocking out uh, a Raspberry Pi Saturday so the girls can come in and build different things. So my ultimate dream is that um, by next year I'm going to have 200 sixth grade girls running around Columbus, Ohio, uploading Cali Linux. So if you think about the problem that we have. I love it and I want to see it. So, oh, watch. And I've got two fifth grade girls that are coming with, just watch. so you know, we're coming to Ohio. No, think, think about the problem that we have in, in the U.S. If we could get this rocking in all these different states, and you get these, I've got two, I've got two inner city schools girls right now that were in sixth grade. That's what they're doing right now today. Neither one of them had a computer until they came to this event. They came home with what, Cali Linux. Her mom texts me every day and sends me videos. Uh, and I'm, it, it, I'm telling you, if, if we can do this, I think it's a good way to fix the, you know, so what it was a Raspberry Pi, I got them at 24 bucks a piece, because I got a deal on them. $24 a piece, I get the, don I get the, I get the monitors donated from the Columbus City Schools, and you, get the, and you get the keyboards. Oh my God, it takes human effort and love. I mean, what a better way to help solve this problem. What else? What else should we be doing? Any? Uh, we're, uh, so please join our Facebook link. Right now, the way that Facebook controls things, you have to be my friend for me to invite you in. Um, but you can, you can follow us on Facebook. Do you have LinkedIn Twitter? Um, I have LinkedIn and I have Twitter. Um, we were also, uh, they mentioned us out at, uh, mm -hmm. Ann Saunders mentioned our project because she says we're the only one in the country doing this right now. She thinks that it's kind of very, very unique. And so Ann Saunders, um, I can't remember, of Microsoft announced Ann Johnson. Ann Johnson, yeah. Ann Johnson it, it meant, announced us out at Microsoft. Um, so we're very, very new and very young and um, it's kind of overwhelming. So I know we're not very formal, but... I think it's amazing, and you know, when I'm, you talk to me about 
giving questions and talking with you about it. You know, as a mom of three girls, you know, and a son, I didn't even realize my own gender bias. Like, I, my son was interested in doing DEF CON this year. And so I sat with him and we put a talk together and he was accepted and he spoke to Roots. I never even thought about asking my girls. And they came, they went, we went to Wicked Six together, we did a lot of stuff cyberwise together. But my oldest daughter said to me as we were getting on the plane, why didn't you ask me, Mom? Mm. And I went, huh, I've got my own bias things. Like it didn't even occur to me because they don't tend to, you know, in their things, enjoy the computers and the security as much as my son. So how do I change my own behaviors to make sure they're doing the same things? So when you and I sat down and talked about this program, I think it's so important because giving young women Linux computers and being able to play on Raspberry Pi and being able to have mentors and role models. It's just such an important thing. So Q Research did a, um, Rat Raytheon did a study about that. Even if these kids go do a capture the flag, 48% of young men know about it. 48% of the men. What's the statistics of the young women? 13%. Most gray hats about that side, the only one that walks in. 13%, 13 of the girls don't. And this is a worse, worse statistic. If you look, if I think Raytheon studied um, in 2016, asked all of the high school boys 40% of the high school boys were asked if they would consider a career in cybersecurity. Only, and out of all of that, only 23% of the girls were asked. So, just asked. Just asked. So, why are the boys being asked in the school systems but not the girls? And of course, all of this still starts with the parenting at home. So if the parenting, and that's why we're hitting the sixth grade, because um, I know for a fact the decision is already made by the eighth and the ninth grade, so that's why, and I, I only know this from 4-H, from that's why I'm doing sixth grade. And again, I had a lot of pushback on that, right? And I pushed, and the decision when you graduate out of fifth grade into the sixth grade, that's the vulnerable year, and that's when they can make their own decision. And that's the right age, and that's where Pew Research says where the, the child is independent enough to make their own decision. And the decision is either going to be influenced 78% of the time by the parent or some phenomenal event, i.e. what's happening next door. Jeopardy right now. It's Jeopardy, Jeopardy right now. Or the fact that they come in and they get to root, they get to program and they get to watch a Raspberry Pi boot up all by themselves because they did it all by themselves. That little act right there is enough for them to remember it. So we have five minutes left. I'm gonna give you a hook for a second. We've got five minutes left, and I bet there's a couple of questions for this amazing lady. Who's got the question or two? Not one. Add them, forgot them. Well, I have one question. Hold on, let me, let me just for the people in the back. So the question was, you know, that it's fantastic that she has a location in Ohio, but are, are, is there concerns about franchising and maybe running into some roadblocks in other areas? So we got a phone. We, we filled up our class in less than 72 hours, and in those 72 hours, you want to know where I got a phone call from? You ever hear Dayton? Dayton has an unemployment rate of 13.3% right now. It's the worst unemployment rate in the country. Mary, Miami Valley Hospital has volunteered to host it. Now, before I did that, my question was, would Huntington National Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, if I got enough interest in the next 10 years, would they be willing to open a SOC? What do you think the question was? What do you think the answer was? Yeah. So the next phone call I got was from Belprio, Ohio. You know what's down in Belpre? 
pots of opium. And then about two weeks later, I got a phone call from Cleveland, Ohio. They want me to go up there in Cleveland, Ohio. So I, I, think, I think the point is that there are parts of the country where these young girls just need a little sense of hope. Even if they're not going to go into cybersecurity, it might make them hopeful to go into technology. It's the fact that we're giving them hopeful to do something, and I think it's the act that you have young women, because I'm not doing the classes, they're my girls doing the classes. These girls are 19 to 26 that are doing it. And the other thing is, is that I'm very sensitive that these girls see that they see themselves. I have Asians doing it, I have Latinos doing it, and I have African Americans doing it, and I have whites doing it. And so the other thing that I hear over and over and over is I need to be able to see me. And so I think the reason why it was so successful is I also had a lady fly in from um, Maryland who happened to live in Columbus who also wanted to be a ballerina and she went to one of these events and she ended up being an engineer so I think that's why it was successful and she had also said you know I never thought that I would dream of going into it but it was the fact that somebody just looked up there and somebody just looked like me I think the to add on a little bit is there's very few programs right now that are really targeting young women in a material way. There's conferences and trainings, but ones that have real computing skills. And there was one in Boston that I was a part of a couple of months ago, and they had um, resume advisors, they had skills labs where if you wanted to try new technology, and this one was based more for collegiate and high school level. And it shocked me. I got off stage from doing a speech at it, and this woman was crying, and she's like, I took three days off of my work because I was really questioning whether I should be in security. And she'd flown in from Houston, Texas, because they had nothing like it in Texas. She'd flown to Boston to go. So I think you're right. There could be some skepticism about the success in some areas of the country, but the reality is, is that we need programs like this because there just aren't enough. With that, we have one minute left. Any other questions? Yep. So the question is, is that um, she has a niece who's in a rural area. She bought a Raspberry Pi computer, and she's getting pressure not to play with it or use it because it's not socially kind of acceptable and not socially cool. So what can you do? One of the things that we were uh, that's one of the things that we were um, sensitive to too was how do we make it so it's not cool and that's one of the things that the whole program is sensitive to is that it's not cool um, one of the things that we did was um, I had a little monster um, her name was Olivia and we put her name on there and so we tried to make it fun and had some games and um, we tried to make it uh, so it, it is cool, and we brought in um, some other people and showed, and then we brought in um, a lot of different things. Have you ever actually been on the raspberrypi.org website and been there? Yeah, and then we have a, then we have a, a lady that, that um, we found at Tufts University um, that writes some very, very good games. Um, that I, I can share with you. Um, 
the, the thing is that you just have to teach her that life's all about choices and, and options, and you have to show her the, the things that are cool, and show her the fun things to do with the Raspberry Pi, because there are some things with the Raspberry Pi that can be nerdy, but then there are other things with the Raspberry Pi that, that aren't nerdy. So you gotta, find, you gotta show her the, the robot things and the things with the Raspberry Pi that aren't nerdy first, and that's where we started. So my advice, having four kids over there, and I live in a rural area, I'm about an hour, just an hour north of Chicago, right on the Wisconsin and Illinois border, tiny town, very blue collar, and my son is a big computer, he loves everything about computers, and he gets picked on a lot about his love of computers and the fact that both his parents are computers and this and that. When we really peeled back the onion and why he was getting bullied about it a little bit, it was nothing more than jealousy because they didn't have the same stuff at home in the same area his friends' homes. You know, it wasn't cool because they didn't have it too. So we marched out and bought a second one. Come on over, come play. Really, Kevin doesn't think you're cool? Great, let's have Kevin come over and let's let Kevin come and have a play date. And all of a sudden, Kevin thinks that, you know, this computer game is the coolest thing since you know, sliced bread and let's look at the Lego robot downstairs and oh my gosh, I want one of those for Christmas too. So we just kind of turned it on that and its head and said, what you really, it, the, nine times out of 10, if it was uncool or the kid that was saying it was uncool, it was jealousy because they didn't have access to the same type of technology. The moment we made that technology available to the kids that were saying it was uncool, it became the coolest thing in the world. And we also made being a nerd cool. So like my son, little blonde, he's running around here in a baseball cap, he will tell you his three things. He's going to be a zoologist, he loves computers, he's a nerd, and he might be a baseball player. But he wears his nerd badge proudly, like he, as we jokingly say, he flies that freak flag high, is what he says to me all the time. All right, with that, we are getting thrown off this stage, so thank you very much to this amazing lady. And she was amazing.